1949, revolution in China. The People's Liberation Army were welcomed as heroes in Beijing. Led by Mao Zedong, the communists had triumphed in a civil war against the nationalists. Soviet support had been unreliable. The Chinese felt they'd managed it alone. The Communist Party seemed wonderful. It was democratic, it was egalitarian, it promised food for everyone. And so, of course, the ideal of communism gradually entered my spirit. The Americans were devastated to lose China, their best friend in Asia. On October 1st, Mao Zedong told the crowd in Tiananmen Square that a new China was born. The country was in chaos, exhausted after years of war. Mao needed external help. One of Mao's first acts was to visit Moscow to get military protection and economic aid. He was met at the station by Foreign Minister Molotov and most of the Politburo. In February 1950, the Chinese and the Soviets signed a mutual defense treaty. The treaty also guaranteed aid for China. At that time, there was the attitude everywhere that uh, Moscow and uh, the Chinese communists were tightly linked hand in hand. This was perceived by many to be part of a worldwide conspiracy and hence was, was somewhat frightening. Mao gratefully accepted the help of Soviet experts in rebuilding Chinese industry. China's rulers embarked on radical land reforms. Land was taken from private owners and handed to the peasants. The former landowners were denounced and humiliated. A million lost their lives. In June 1950, North Korea, with Soviet and Chinese backing, attacked South Korea. The sudden attack by the North Koreans dealt the slender forces below the 38th parallel a mortal blow. The prompt arrival on the scene of U.S. soldiers gave Marshal Stalin and his cold-eyed strategists a rude shock. Forces under United Nations command pushed the invaders back to the Chinese border. China feared an attack on its own territory. The main enemy was America. At that time, all the propaganda was directed against America. The proletariat of the whole world must unite to get rid of the capitalists. America was a capitalist country, and so it had to be got rid of. Under the banner, Help Korea, down with U.S. imperialism, more than one million Chinese troops would cross the border into Korea. The Korean War lasted for three years and cost more than half a million Chinese lives.
In China, cinema audiences watched films of bumper harvests and new industrial records. Steel production was a yardstick of national virility. The success of the first three-year plan was celebrated. But although exhilarating, Soviet aid had to be paid for. Stalin's death in 1953 had a deep impact in China. Despite Mao's misgivings, he had respected the Soviet leader's iron authority. After a power struggle in the Kremlin, Nikita Khrushchev emerged as the new Soviet leader. He and his Politburo visited China to maintain the alliance. The size and power of the communist bloc made the new American administration increasingly anxious. We can see that China is the basic cause of all of our troubles in Asia. If China had not gone communist, we would not have had a war in Korea. If China were not communist, there would be no war in Indochina. There would be no war in Malaya. Today, there are approximately 540 million people who can be counted on the side of the free nations. There are 800 million on the communist side. And there are 600 million others who must be counted as non-committed. America did everything to stop the spread of communism. To prevent China attacking the Chinese nationalist stronghold of Formosa or Taiwan, the United States financed a military buildup on the island. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, along with his American advisors, reviews free Chinese nationalist forces in an Independence Day parade. More than a half million soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines have as their ultimate aim and living goal the return to China's mainland. The nationalist government was determined to defend two small islands off the China coast, Kemoi and Matsu. In September 1954, the communists shelled the island of Kimoi. Three months later, Washington signed a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. Almost immediately, the major units of the 7th Fleet are shifted to Formosa to augment the United States and nationalist patrols in the strait and along the mainland. The action upholds the United States pledge to meet the common danger, communism. The American show of strength failed to stop the Chinese communist challenge. All-out war came closer. America made nuclear threats. Mao's provocation and America's response concerned Khrushchev, whose nuclear bombs guaranteed China's security. Khrushchev told the Chinese that war with imperialism was no longer inevitable. At the 20th Soviet Party Congress in February 1956, in a secret session that was not filmed, Khrushchev denounced Stalin as a criminal. Mao took it as a threat to his own style of leadership. In October 1956, the Hungarians rose up against Soviet domination. While Khrushchev hesitated, Mao urged a violent crackdown. For the 40th anniversary of the Soviet Revolution, Mao went to Moscow. He used the occasion to put himself forward as the new leader of world revolution. <laughs> But Soviet aid was undermining Mao's aim for total independence. The crunch came in 1958. 
Khrushchev wanted to set up a long-wave radio station along the Chinese coast to guide Soviet submarines. He suggested setting up a joint naval fleet. This was a clear sign that the Soviets wanted to control China. Mao still needed Soviet know-how. He wanted to create China's own nuclear industry. The Chinese comrades then expressed a new wish. They said they would very much like to receive more aid from us in order to build plants and facilities for the production of the atomic bomb. Such an agreement was signed. Mao said that the atomic bomb was a paper tiger. But he also knew that whether a country had the atomic bomb or not had a huge bearing on its position in the world and on its international influence. In 1958, Khrushchev visited China to renew Soviet support. But Mao's nuclear demands had already strained relations with the big brother. Mao Zedong said, you are communists. And we are communists. Communists usually share. Will you give us the atomic bomb or not? Khrushchev. And what do you want the atomic bomb for? We have the atomic bomb. And we will stand up for China just the same as we would for the Soviet Union. Yes, Mao said. It's true. But we are not just some tin pot village. China is a great country and we want to have it. Khrushchev, you don't need it, and so on. Mao then says, so you don't want to give it to us then. The struggle for preeminence in the communist world was now out in the open. Here were two despots, each used to having his own way. They couldn't cooperate. In the communist camp, the question was always, who was number one? Who was the Tsar? On one occasion during the 1959 trip, Khrushchev spoke disrespectfully about Mao Zedong. He said that Mao was an old boot that ought to be thrown out. Soviet advisers would soon be withdrawn from China. Rivalry between the communist powers was ideological as well as personal. Ideological squabbles could get quite comical. The Soviet side would say, we are the Marxists. And then the Chinese would say, no, we are the Marxists. The Soviets would say, we are red. And the Chinese would say, we are even redder. It could appear funny, but the damage was really serious. In 1958, Mao had thought up a new policy, the Great Leap Forward, the grandiose plan to transform China into a rich world power. Land was taken over by the state, the family unit was to disappear. People were organized into huge communes. A utopian world of plenty would come from sheer force of will. Mao's method was to be a more extreme version of Stalin's brutal collectivization of the 1930s. The Great Leap Forward was a kind of recklessness. Mao wanted to change the face of China in the shortest time possible. The slogan was, struggle hard for three years, change the face of China, catch up with Britain, catch up with America. It was completely unrealistic. Because steel remained a key symbol of national vitality, the entire country reverted to pre-industrial backyard furnaces. People worked day and night to produce massive amounts of useless metal. Crops 
crops were left to rot. Scientific knowledge and all common sense were ignored. No one dared to tell the truth for fear of arrest or worse. The lies of the Great Leap Forward were absolutely unbelievable. Anybody who did not speak in falsehoods was demoted or expelled from their jobs. From the time of the Great Leap Forward, all Chinese people learned to tell lies. The peasants' food was taken from them by force to make up bogus quotas. It was one of the worst man-made disasters in history. We had to eat the husks of coarse grain, not even the grain itself. We ate leaves off trees. We all went down with hepatitis. Many peasants died of starvation. No one really knew how many. Because of Mao's policy, over 30 million people starved to death. Hiding the catastrophe, Mao still posed as the leader of world communism. Blocked by Washington from the United Nations, China became the champion of anti-American causes. Third world leaders and Western intellectuals flocked to Beijing. In Moscow, Khrushchev was pursuing peaceful coexistence with the West. The Kremlin is the setting of an historic event, the signing of an atom test ban. The big three representatives, Dean Rusk, Andrei Gromyko, and Lord Hume, signed for the US, Russia, and Britain. Most other nations of the world, with the notable exception of France, Communist China, and Cuba, are to sign later. Communist China has denounced the Soviets for making the treaty, widening further the breach between the two communist powers. Mao reacted to the nuclear test ban treaty with defiance. The Chinese Communist nuclear detonation is a reflection of policies which do not serve the cause of peace. In 1965, U.S. Marines were sent to South Vietnam. President Johnson was determined to prevent communist North Vietnam and its allies in the South gaining power. In China, the masses were mobilized to support neighboring North Vietnam. A war between China and the United States was once again a possibility. Haunted by the failure of the Great Leap Forward, Mao was fighting to maintain his domination of China. In 1966, he launched the Great Cultural Revolution. He failed to bring about an economic miracle, so in 1966 he wanted a political miracle. He not only wanted to get rid of his enemies, he wanted to do something that Stalin had been unable to do, destroy government bureaucracy. The Mao personality cult did not come to for blossoming until the Cultural Revolution, when he became the so-called four greats, the great leader, great helmsman, uh, great supreme commander, great teacher. He has replaced Stalin. 
Millions of young people were recruited to be Mao's Red Guards. Their idealism was exploited to create mayhem and to destroy every vestige of the past. Chairman Mao says, Marxism consists of thousands of truths, but they all boil down to one phrase, it's right to rebel. The first action was to change the names of roads. The name of the road outside the Soviet embassy was changed to anti-revisionism road. There were demonstrations outside the Soviet embassy. Most of the demonstrators were Red Guards. In the morning, they would hang up dummies of Brezhnev, Kosygin and Podgorny. When it began to get dark, they took them down and started a huge bonfire at the entrance of the embassy and burnt the dummies. The Red Guards and the young people gathered around the fire and danced and yelled anti-Soviet slogans. In 1969, tension along the vast Soviet-Chinese border increased. Images of aggressive Chinese at the border fueled Soviet fears of an invasion. Siberia and the Far East were sparsely populated. So what if the Chinese millions began pouring in? Writers had warned before about the yellow peril, that the Chinese would come right through Russia and conquer Europe. Soviet Premier Kosygin visited Beijing in October 1969 to stop a potential war and restore relations. Mao, fearful of Moscow's belligerence, had already decided he wanted better relations with America. America's new president, Richard Nixon, although a lifelong anti-communist, came to a similar conclusion. To limit Soviet power and end the Vietnam War, he wanted to draw closer to China. Dr. Henry Kissinger. With his new national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, Nixon developed a foreign policy which exploited the hostility between the communist giants. Nixon's trip to Beijing changed the balance of the Cold War. His Chinese triumph also stole the headlines from the increasingly grim events in Vietnam. Premier Zhou Enlai moves forward to greet the first American president to set foot on Chinese soil. <laughs> East meets West as a handshake bridges 16,000 miles and 22 years of hostility. There are no welcoming speeches, no formal ceremonies, just a receiving line made up of Communist Party officials and the military band playing the Star Spangled Banner. Peking newspapers, which had played down the Nixon visit, now give it front page coverage. Dealers sell out as readers follow day by day the president's activities. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. Give me a pair of <laughs> I didn't put my foot down and say, now I've just made history. On the way back from Beijing, I knew we had made history.